Hi Queens, I have Ella Matthews with me today. I'll read her bio for you, then I'll introduce her to the podcast. So Ella Matthews has a unique style and skill set to help people out of physical, mental and emotional pain. By combining cognitive hypnotherapy, pain neuroscience education, trauma release exercises and, oh here we go, here's a word, Butego? Butego. Butego, thank you. Breathing tuition. She provides a top down, bottom up, comprehensive approach to healing, which has gained her an impeccable reputation as a competent, kind, and knowledgeable therapist. Ah, wonderful bio. So, Ella, welcome to the Body Love Binge podcast. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you. So, shall we dive in with 10 quick fire questions? Let's. Let's go for it. Okay. Number one Have you got a favorite book? Oh, that's a tricky one. I've got a favourite top 100 books. Give us um, your top three. My top three? Yeah. Well, um, anything by Gabor Mate, because he's just a legend. Um, I'm currently reading some, what other people would probably consider very dry, but I consider it absolutely fascinating, um, books about chronic pain. Mm-hmm. Um, explain pain is a fantastic manual for people who want to learn more about chronic pain and that's kind of like a bible for me and that's such a good question because it's really hard to narrow it down Mm. Uh, I'm a total book fiend anything about trauma um, is my jam so I'm afraid I can't answer that in a short in a short way (laughs) not a problem at all okay number two if you could have dinner with any historical figure who would it be and why Oh, that's another good question, isn't it? Oh, I don't know how short these answers are going to be. Let me say probably Bob Marley, because Ooh, yeah. he was an he was just a legend and his view, his his view of the world was unique. And I think he's a, a true peacemaker and healer. And I'm actually really sad that he's dead, even mm-hmm. though he died when I was a kid. Um, because if he was alive today, the world would be a much better place. Yeah. I watched the Bob Marley movie literally on this last weekend, just gone. Oh, okay. Is it, it really worth, it, worth a watch? Yeah, for sure. Wow. Worth a watch. Okay, number three. What's the most interesting place you've ever travelled to? Another great question. Um, I've travelled a lot, so I'd say probably the most interesting place for me was Hong Kong because I went there entirely by myself and so Mm. I was just chucked in the deep end and it was like stepping onto another planet it was so actually Shanghai similar just completely different so different like almost nothing recognizable in terms of culture so yeah that yeah the, the 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 Asian countries um sort of developed but also slightly off the beaten track Wow, yeah, it's not a place you want to mess with at all. It's crazy. Mm. How long's the flight? This, I mean, it, they're meant to be quick fire, but I ask questions, so they're not uh-huh. even. Easy, but I'm curious, how long is the flight? The, lo- the flight was pretty long. It was maybe like I think there might have been a a couple of hours stopover, but it was probably it was under twelve hours. But you know, anything over four hours starts to feel pretty, pretty long. But it was worth it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. Thank you for sharing. Right. Oh, this is an easy one. What's your favorite food? Avocado. Ooh. Number five, if you could <laughs> master one skill overnight, what would it be? Absolutely. Trying. To, I'm trying to learn Spanish at the moment. So speaking Spanish would be super helpful. <laughs> awesome. Number <clears throat> six, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? And did you take it? <laughs> okay um <laughs> let me answer that one um <laughs> I'm not going to answer that entirely truthfully for reasons that I can't share with the readers and I will tell you later and you'll understand why because it was more an actual it was more a joke than a piece of advice <clears throat> okay but I would say don't take yourself too seriously. And no, I probably didn't take it. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm working on that one still. <laughs> Love that advice. And I agree with that one too. Okay, number seven, what's the last song you listened to on repeat? Ooh, um, at the moment, my jam is a song called Drover by Bill Callahan. 
and I'm listening to that a couple of times a day at the moment. Oh, not heard that one. Mm, it's not my usual thing, but it's 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 almost like country music. My my husband's stealthily getting me into country music. That's yeah, that's something that I'm I'm learning to like it. I love country music. And you? Music <laughs> I never used to. Crazy, <laughs> nice, easy to listen to mm. kind of music. Mm. Mm. Okay, what's your favorite way to unwind after a long day? Definitely a hot bath. And probably some relaxing music and speaking to my husband and um, some deep breathing. Like that's got to come into the picture somewhere because I've got to walk the walk, right? So, yeah, deep breaths in the bath is the one. Love that. I have a question about breathing. I'll save it till you get into the mm. part of our convo. Sure. Um, number nine, night of dancing or night in with a book? Oh, night in with a book every time. Same. I've done the dancing. It was great. I like daytime dancing. I was in bed by half past eight last night. I don't, I don't, I'm not sh ashamed to to share that with people. <laughs> Ella, I am with you at nine o'clock. That's when I start getting ready for bed. It would make nine o'clock is bedtime. Thousand <laughs> percent. My friend, well, one friend calls me granny, but I'm owning it and I'm happily like getting that. fully, fully refreshed. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Okay, number 10, last one for the quick fire ones. What do you want people to take away from this podcast? I would like people to take away a sense of hope that even if they're suffering right now, things can change. Mm, I love that. So let's dive in with, this is a question I asked you to ask. Okay, that make, does no sense. Mm -hmm. I asked you what questions you like to be asked and you mm -hmm. said this one and I love this one. Um, and I'm curious also, Ella, so why do you do what you do? Well, often people retrain as therapists because of their own personal experiences and I'm no different from that. Mm -hmm. So I've always had a deep desire to help people and I was a massage therapist for years before I retrained doing what I'm doing now. Um, and I also had a period of time where I was caring for my mum as she had cancer she sadly did die five years ago but I had a couple of incidences during that very difficult time in my life which led me to become injured and at the time I just assumed that the physical injury was caused by physical damage but it's a lot more complicated than that and the understand since I have more understanding now uh, I now know that there was an absolute connection between what was going on emotionally for me at that time and the physical state of my body. But at the time I didn't know that. And I suffered with pain for years afterwards, like really quite severe pain. And it was only after I expanded my understanding of that and went through some emotional processing that I got out of pain. So now I'm in a position to be able to share uh, my experience but also share the information and the tools and techniques and knowledge that I gained to help other people get out of pain wow you know I'm so glad that you've shared it in the way you have because I was I was the person who like you I guess until you did all the training and everything if you hurt yourself or if you had pain it was linked to a physical experience or a physical ailment or nothing to do with anything to do with emotional and what's going mm. on in your inner worlds. Mm. I have a different view on that now, the more I learn about trauma mm. and all of that. So can you give me, um, or our listeners and me, because I'm in interested in the answer to this, some, like, let's say three examples of where a client might be experiencing pain, physical pain, and how that can be linked to what's going on emotionally for them. Sure. So there's actually a very weak correlation between pain and tissue damage. Pain is simply your body's perception of how much danger you're in. Right. And so any danger can be interpreted as pain. And that our bodies can't distinguish between an imaginary threat or a real threat because our subconscious, that's why we could wake up in the middle of the night having had a terrible dream and we'd be shaky and sweaty. There wasn't anything attacking us. We were asleep, but our imagination is that powerful that mm. your subconscious brain and your nervous system will interpret danger from whether or not 
it's something you've watched on the news or whether you feel physically threatened or whether you're having um, critical self-judgmental thoughts. So an example I can give is someone who recently came to me who had a low self-esteem. She didn't connect. She hadn't connected that to her hip pain mm. and I helped her join the dots. And within three sessions, she was pain free because she hadn't realized she had had a hip injury, but she thought that this was a persistent problem from the injury when in fact all injuries heal. You can break a bone and be have no physical damage within six weeks to two months, right? So yeah. if physical pain is persisting longer than three months, at that point it's technically chronic. And most chronic pain is due to oversensitization of your brain to the pain. Another example would be um I saw someone today actually and and she has eye pain and she has it in a, as a cyclical nature and she's sort of connecting the dots to that and hormones and we haven't got to the bottom of it yet but she is quite harsh on herself and often when you change the inner voice when you change the way you talk to yourself regarding your symptoms mm. you're changing the lens through which you see those symptoms and that gives you the chance to to change your perception. Mm -hmm. um, another example would be fibromyalgia, for example. I have people who come to me with fibromyalgia, which is often caused by a phenomenon called central sensitization, which is when your nervous system kind of gets stuck on on and everything it gets too sensitized and everything is perceived as threatening. And once you give your nervous system a chance to recalibrate, you can turn all of those stressors down and then stuff that previously felt threatening doesn't necessarily need to be. And at that point, your body doesn't need to produce symptoms anymore. Now, I'm not saying I can fix fibro because that's not true and it's not as simple as that. Mm -hmm. But once you tune into your body's signals and listen to them on a, on a deep physical level, your body then doesn't need to start screaming at you because you've yeah. listened to those whispers and you've had that open communication. So ignoring your body's symptoms, becoming cut off from the neck down, it's not very healthy. You might be able to numb stuff out in the short term, but actually having that healthy communication between your mind and your body is absolutely vital for having a healthy perception of your levels of danger versus safety, which is basically everything comes down to danger versus safety for your nervous system. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing those, Ella. And it's reminded me of something that I would like to share for you yeah. and, and the listeners more mm. so. Um, I used to have a chronic pain in my right hip. It was more right. like my hip flexor type area. Um, I didn't understand until I went through what um, I, we, she calls an immersion, which is a deep therapy session all around your inner child and past childhood mm -hmm. experiences with the support of some plant medicine just a very mm -hmm. low dose mm -hmm. that that was that hip pain was directly connected with the codependency and enmeshment that I had with my mother mm, interestingly enough mm -hmm. she also had a hip replacement on the right hip oh really yeah that's gone now so uh, through right. that experience through yeah. I was Lying, lying down with my eyes closed she was guiding me through an experience that was bringing my mum into the picture yeah it was hurting so much like it was like on fire mm. and then after that experience it's completely gone that's so interesting isn't it and it actually doesn't surprise me because that's exactly what I'm talking about because there's such a close connection between your internal emotional landscape and your physical perception of pain and especially if you've had ACEs adverse childhood experiences that clouds the lens through which you perceive the world mm -hmm. um, and you know often a question that I will ask people is what happened in your life between five years to up to six months prior to this onset of pain and there will always be that like I'd say 90 percent 99 percent of the time there'll be a connection between whatever stressful thing happened in their life and the onset of pain and when you take away the need for stress from that experience whether it's through therapy or through body-based somatic exercises or through journaling or whatever you, whichever way you want to address it 
then often the need for the body to continue to create symptoms just falls away. Wow. It's so amazing. there's definitely a connection there for, between what happened with you and your mum and especially the fact it was on the same hip. That's not a coincidence. Mm -mm. No. And so question, I guess I, I'm always fully honest. This is something I experience, not all the time from time to time, but it's been chronic since I was since I stopped working with horses, actually, which would have been when I was about 30, mm. no back pain, which mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure is very common, like to the common. point where if I'm sitting for more than an hour, I'm kind of like having to keep adjusting and cross my legs and change. Yeah. So without you obviously coaching me or using up a lot of your time for that, I'm sure a lot of people can resonate. Without knowing much about me, would that be resonating with some kind of emotional trauma or experience, in your opinion? So low back pain, super common. Most of the time it doesn't have a hugely structural element. There might be an influence in that in terms of if you have to sit for long times, obviously your body likes movement. It might be that your posture needs a bit of correcting. It might be that you need to do some specific stretches, but that's alongside the understanding that your brain can get turned up and stuck on a hypersensitive mode. And that then creates the symptoms, creates the, the environment for chronic pain to flourish. So, yes, the stretching helps, the movement helps, but also asking yourself the question, for example, is it just that chair that you sit in or is it all chairs? Or every any it's sitting. all the chairs, any sitting. OK. And does that does it ever take a day off? Is there ever an environment where you sit down in a chair and you don't experience pain or is it all the time? All the time. And is it after a certain period of time or is it um, sort of straight away? It's after usually about an hour. About an hour. Sorry, you said. And is it on one side or both or does it switch? Uh, both. Both. Yeah. So. It's a, it's a lot to go into here, but what yeah. I would usually do with a client is help to pinpoint any triggers and help to understand what stresses are going on in your life mm -hmm. and then help help you to understand any positive aspects of your life because really it's about the balance of the two, right? So yeah. you can look into lower back pain isn't just something that happens to your lower back and there's nothing else going on. There's so many different factors going on and being able to pinpoint factors that are making it worse with the intention to unwind them, whether or not that's a critical inner voice or a never ending to do list or perfectionism or people pleasing or high conscientiousness or not being believed by medical professionals. That's a big one. If you go to the doctor and they say, no, don't you don't be silly. You're making up huge. Being medically gaslit is really bad for pain. Mm -hmm. And then focusing on the things that do bring you joy and make you happy. You know, what exercise haven't you been doing recently? What is there any friends you need to connect with? And looking at the ste stepping back and looking at the bigger picture mm. is way more effective than I'll oh, have some painkillers and, you know, get a massage because that stuff is great in the short term. But when you take away the root cause, the need for that pain perception, then the pain just falls away. So without sort of spending all yeah. of our time focusing on this one thing but it's important to to recognize that this is something that millions of people suffer with and they don't have a resolution and that's because the medical professionals are failing them not because they're doing anything wrong um but expanding your ex your understanding of pain is one way out of pain because that knowledge is really empowering wow so you you mentioned um when you were speaking before i think you said the word body somatic release or something around that can you share briefly the different modalities that you work with with clients and then a little bit about what each one might look like yes absolutely so on a physical level I work with trauma release exercises which is quite an innovative way of literally shaking off tension stress mm -hmm. trauma um it's it's very bottom up. So it's seven quite simple exercises, which when done in an environment of safety, allow your body to do what it wants to do. And what your body wants to do is to shake. Mm -hmm. So you do the exercises, you lie down. It's very important you feel safe because that's the only context in which this is helpful because the safety then provides a corrective experience. Yeah. And you allow yourself to shake. And, and by doing that, if there's any 
so we have often we have what's called parasitic tension which is muscular tension we don't even know we're carrying around and this mm. might be may or may not be the case for you and your lower back we don't notice we're carrying it but what happens when you squeeze a muscle tight for a long time it gets tired so when you release parasitic tension on a physical level it frees up energy in the body mm. also helping to reset your nervous system back to a state of balance and calm so your nervous system it's a bit like a seesaw right you've got your rest digest growth and repair arm on one side and you've got your fight flight fawn or freeze on the other and you're supposed to have a healthy flexibility but we can kind of get stuck in that stress response so tre helps to rebalance that seesaw and the aim isn't to be calm and relaxed all the time because that would be inappropriate sometimes we need that mobilizing energy to get stuff done the aim is to have balance so being able to bring yourself back to a state of balance so that you can respond appropriately, depending on your circumstances, super important, super healthy for your body to be able to have that ability to flex from one side to the other. So that's TRE. I tend to do that separately because it's it requires a, a different approach to the hypnotherapy. But the hypnotherapy, the type that I'm trained in is cognitive hypnotherapy which comes with the understanding that we're all unique and everyone needs a different approach and that we all go in and out of trance states every day. So trance isn't like a magical special state. It's not something I do to you. It's a natural state. It can happen when you're driving, you know, you get from A to B and you can't remember the journey because you were so engrossed in thinking of something else. That's your driving trance. People who are addicted to smoking, that particular motion, that's their smoking trance. You do it without thinking, right? So it's your subconscious running the show. Being able to influence that with positive suggestion, it's a bit more of a, a top down approach. You know, it's using the brain to influence the body. Mm -hmm. But I also come with the understanding that our brains aren't just separate things that our bodies are there to carry around. Our brains are always embedded within our bodies and our bodies are always embedded within our environment, within our community. So that's called embodied cognition. It's the understanding that our brains are a feature of society rather than just sort of separate little boxes that we carry around in our heads. And so the cognitive part of cognitive hypnotherapy comes with the understanding for me that your brain is part of your body and your body is also part of your brain because your brain extends down into your spinal cord. The two are connected. You can't take them apart. And your mm -hmm. spinal cord goes all the way down your spine, obviously. So looking at the bigger picture is kind of what I've trained myself to do and pull, pulling these different approaches together is really, really helpful for clients because if one thing doesn't work, that's fine. We've got something else, right? Yeah. On top of that, I practice Buteco breathing, which basically it was designed to help normalize dif dysfunctional breathing for people with breathing issues such as asthma, other types of COPD. And what it does is it normalizes your blood gas balance it in decreases symptoms of breathlessness and it helps you understand your own breathing mechanics because a lot of us don't breathe correctly and again that will drive the fight flight response it will increase our anxiety and it's often the missing link is under when you understand your breathing everything else can fall into place because that's one of the pillars of health right like you can't go without it so having some influence over that because your breath is the only part of your autonomic nervous system under conscious control. And when you influence that, everything else can, everything else can fall into place basically. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Those all sound incredible. So now we've spoke about the breath. I have a question around mm. that. And mm. actually this particular client who's listening will be very grateful. I've asked this and I've only ever met two people in my life so far that I, that has experienced the same as what I have. Right. And I know intuitively it's linked to anxiety. I know intuitively it's linked to trauma stored in the body, which I also would love to ask you about, mm. but it's this thing where, um, when me or this client is anxious or feels under pressure, you can't take a full breath. So you kind mm -hmm. of have to go, and it's like you still can't get a full breath and then your body mm -hmm. will yawn and mm -hmm. on purpose. And then only when you yawn, can you then like feel like you've got enough breath in? Mm -hmm. Does that description yeah. make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So yawning, that's one of the ways that we, our body will return to homeostasis. So we come back to balance. Yawning mm -hmm. is a signal that your, your rest digest arm of the sympathetic 
nervous system has kicked in. So your parasympathetic has kicked in. And that's probably your body coming back to a state of, okay, everything's okay now. Mm -hmm. Regarding feeling that you can't take a deep breath in, at that point, rather than taking a deep breath in, take a deep breath out. Mm -hmm. So what you're aiming to do is fully, fully, fully release all the air from your lungs. And then you don't need to do anything. You just relax because your body will breathe itself. So rather than forcefully trying to breathe in and feeling like you can't, when you take a really, really deep breath out and you release all the air from your lungs and then you just let your body do what it wants to do, what it's going to do is breathe. And at that point, you'll feel that you can take a deep breath in. I've just done that as you were sharing and that is like magic. That's so cool. Did you? Yeah, okay. I was like, okay, all yeah. the way out till there's nothing left. And then yeah. naturally my body just was like, easily breathing in I mean I didn't have the anxious thing now yes. at this point but I notice a difference like in a feeling within mm. me so thank you so much for sharing that well, but when actually doing it before you have that anxious feeling is really good because you're training your body so that next time you do it if you do feel anxious you'll go oh, I've done this before and it worked so you've just given yourself a corrective experience that is so cool Okay, so let's talk about trauma being stored in the body then, because one mm. example I like um, that I experienced was I'd go for a massage. Yeah, I would be fully relaxed after a ninety minute massage. I'd get in the car, I wasn't stressed or anything, but you think about your day, and then I would notice that my body was tensing up mm. as if to get back the normal level of tension mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. my body. And when I noticed that, I was like, "Wow, that is so interesting." So. Mm. Is that linked to, I guess, your quote normal of what tension you hold within you? Where do we get the tension from? And how can trauma, like a traumatic experience, whether it's chronic emotional trauma from childhood and acute traumatic experience, mm. how does that get stored in the body's cells? Because it does, doesn't it? Yeah, really good question. So we kind of get used to what we uh, what we find normal. And if if being super duper relaxed isn't normal for us, we will just go back to the normal resting state of tense if that was what we're used to carrying around and that's what i mean by parasitic tension we'll hold on to this stuff without even noticing it mm. and actually at that point if you do do something like get a massage or have a breathwork session or do some deep meditation the the, re the release that comes from that can actually feel jarring because mm. we're not used to it we're so used to being having this sort of underlying hyper alert like hyper vigilant state so yeah your body will the thing is it's really important to remember that even though you come back to a state of what you've your, your body is used to, it doesn't mean that it's stuck like that because of the phenomenon of bioplasticity, which is your body's ability to change given different inputs. Same as neuroplasticity, your brain's ability to change. We have that in our body as well. The I can't remember the second facet of your question, but the third one was how do you store, how does trauma get stored in the body? Yeah. So specifically, especially before we were able to talk, when we were pre-verbal, we didn't have the words to describe what was going on to us, right? Because we didn't, we hadn't, we didn't have the capacity to talk yet. Yeah. And if specifically, if trauma happens to us before the ages of one up until about th of zero up until about three, we don't have the words to express that. So that gets stored as implicit memory. Yeah. And implicit memory is bod is memory stored on a bodily level. So even if you can't cognitively remember, if something not great happened to you before the age where you learned to talk, that gets stored on a tissue level in the body. Mm -hmm. And again, because the nervous system, everything is a balance between what is safe, what is dangerous. Stuff that happens to us that's dangerous is going to get lodged more securely than st everyday stuff that happens that's safe because our bodies need to remember that so that they can that can avoid happening to us again but that can then work against us because obviously it's really unpleasant to have trauma and to carry around this difficulty in the way that you relate to the world you know like I said it's a lens that clouds the way you see the world but the good news is you know because of bioplasticity everybody has the ability to bring themselves back to a healthy state of balance, especially if you're surrounded by safe people, yeah. you know, so much of healing is done in connection and having people around you who 
understand and support you, even if they don't know the finer details, you don't, that's not necessarily um, problematic at all. Feeling supported is one of the biggest ways you can support your own healing. You know, healing doesn't occur um, in isolation. So having a trusted therapist or having good friends or being able to reach out to people when you need it, um, as well as having the tools for yourself, super important. But yeah, um, it's trauma doesn't necessarily go away just with talking because yeah. when the talking about it, unless it's done with the resolution to release whatever is being held onto, it can actually be re-traumatizing, which is why things like CBT have their limitations. Mm. So what would you do with a client who has talked about it and has, has perhaps released really some shame around that because mm. you met them with love and understanding and held that mm. safe space? Um, would it be kind of somatic release through physical movement? Would it be hypnotherapy? I guess everyone's different. Would it be a correlation of the two? Yeah, everyone's different. And often it is a correlation of the two. And often when we have these things we're holding on to it does inhibit our breath so being able to breathe properly is a that would be one of the first things that I would assess but TRE is is so fantastic not many people have heard of it it's what does it stand for it stands for trauma and tension release exercises mm. and it's a way of releasing trauma without having to relive it so you don't even need to think about whatever it was that traumatized you that doesn't need to come into the picture. You can release it on a physical level. And then having that felt experience of safety is a corrective experience. So the more time you can spend in the relaxation period afterwards, the more you're sending a signal to your body of it's OK to relax and be safe. And that's where the facilitation comes in. It's taught as a self-help tool. So within once you've had done it a couple of times with someone who's trained and you feel safe to do so, you can then do it as a at home practice. But doing it in a supportive environment with someone who is trained to support you is a really fantastic way of starting that process of releasing anything that's stuck. Wow. So does it involve um, EFT tapping? Does it involve like rocking or does it depend on who you have in front of you and what they need? So the process is actually quite a set one for the getting to the point to do the act. The, the exercises come first and they're in a set order. But then after that, you the whoever is doing it whether it's you or someone else lies down and just relaxes and it involves um, neurogenic tremors so they often start off in the hips they're distinguished from pathological tremors for example parkinson's um, dystonia that's created in a completely different part of the brain and people conflate tremors with being something pathological because of parkinson's which is understandable but it's a different part of the brain that's responsible for the neurogenic tremors that means arising from the nervous system and they start from the brain stem and they usually start off in your hips because the thing is you have a very big uh, hip flexor called your psoas and that is literally your fight or flight muscle because it kicks and it runs. That's what it does. But nowadays we're not, you know, running away from someone with spears. It might be our boss that's shouted at us and it's not really appropriate to punch him in the head and run away in the court to the corner and shake. So we just store all of this stuff up. Right. And then we go home and wonder why we can't relax at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's a way of completing that stress cycle, letting go of anything that's stuck in your tissues and often the shaking will then um, move or migrate from the hips to the legs or sometimes further up the body. So it's a way of really just restoring your body's natural intelligence and bringing your nervous system back to a state of balance without the need for, for words. Wow, this is so incredible, Ella. And so what you've shared has reminded me of, I think it was from The Power of Now by Echo Tolle. Mm -hmm or mm -hmm. told whether you say his surname mm -hmm. and I think in the book he mentions if you look at ducks on the pond or I've noticed this in my dog um so I'll give my dog's analogy because it makes mm. more sense to me so when my dog is not castrate is not castrated so he's a man with balls mm -hmm. so whatever he sees another male with balls in the distance or close up there's a natural biological instinct if it's a similar age to just be aware to protect me whatever it is yeah and then when that threat, if you like, is gone, he will do a big shake. He'll yes. shake every. He'll shake all that excess energy off, yeah. and he'll get on with the walk. And that is your dog doing TRE. <laughs> that's it, right? Same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. So that's what Echo Toll said. When you notice ducks fighting on a pond or whatever, when yeah. they finish their fighting, they'll 
shake. And, and they won't just... ever need to think about that again. And they'll go off and they'll be friends. Yes. They've reset their stress, their stress cycle. And we don't do it as humans. We just don't. Yes. We've been kind of in we've been kind of suppressed in our ability to be able to release that. And so TRE, it's a very um regulated way of letting that letting your body return back to that state of balance yeah that's awesome so would dancing help you know when dancing is one of the best ways to do it yeah yeah Yeah. and I personally think that that intuitive shaking that comes with that dancing you you know if you look at like tribal cultures they'll do stamping of their heels they'll do bouncing on the hills they'll jump all of that is a way to complete your stress cycle you know other ways they always involve movement so running yoga not necessarily although obviously yoga has loads of benefits but like bouncing stamping shaking running punching things kicking things um humming singing all of these ways to uh, active ways to complete your stress cycle and without that it just builds up inside us you know and then we have insomnia we get burnt out we turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms we end up shouting at the cat you know um it's really important to physically and proactively let go of your stress on the daily basis so like 20 minutes a day really is what you need to be aiming at not necessarily tre that works best at like two maybe three times a week um maximum you don't really need to do it any more than that but yeah completing your stress cycle is a really big one wow so would you say that those with um eating disorders or exercise addiction which i used to have Mm -hmm. it is a biological response to restriction in terms of anorexia but that aside um someone who is obsessed with exercise needing to move all the time which used to be me would you say that is linked to all this anxiety and trauma stored in the body that like needs to get out somehow Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, and I've got close family members who've been addicted to exercise, been anorexic and that constant being on the move. That's your fight or flight in motion. That is your body stuck in fight or flight. Yes. You know, and being able to recognize that and take active steps to be able to release that instinctive pushing away or running away or or fighting you know and often that fight is with your own body Mm -hmm. and then coming back to balance with healthy restorative active rest you know super important but recognizing it is the first thing yeah and would you say with the fear responses the um fight flight freeze or fawn I mean fawn is a newish one isn't it that's like more of a behavior people pleasing type so it's been it's more recently recognized but it's basically appeasing you know it's keeping the peace so that you don't there's no further harm turned towards you and a lot of people don't realize they're doing it because there isn't as much understanding of it yet um but when you understand it it gives you a lot of uh, it, it can stop that negative chatter of well I should have done something more I should have run away I shouldn't have been so nice you know because it's a protective response when the other ones have failed yeah so with freeze I was wanting mm-hmm. to ask you about so my I guess people's has a, have a different reaction depending on the situation mm-hmm. my go-to trauma response or fight or flight is is to fight yep. however I've been in situations um sexually where I've just froze mm-hmm. and not done anything mm-hmm. Is am I right in assuming that if someone's in a freeze response, it can be more damaging or traumatic because it's almost like there's nothing you can't fight to try. You, there's a hope to get away if you're fighting. There's a hope to get away if you're yeah. if you're running away. Yeah. But when you're just freezing, it's almost like whatever's going to happen to me, it's going to happen. It's almost certain. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It can be more traumatizing because, well, for a few reasons, on a bodily level, you you only really tend to freeze if fight, flight aren't available to you. You know, if you're stuck or if it's more dangerous to fight because your attacker is stronger than you, for example. So freeze is kind of the last chance. It's the it's the last response. Um, It's what animals playing dead do. You know, when you see an animal and it's pretending to be dead, it's the same. It's the same physiologically for humans and it can look like not much is going on but it's all the stress hormones going round and round and round without the ability to actually mobilize them Mm. and so on a cognitive level it can be more stressful because 
unless again there's that recognition of that's what's going on you can think to yourself well why didn't I fight back I should have run away why didn't I go and tell someone why did I continue to see this person with and blame yourself so there's an element of self-blame which I've seen a lot with my clients I could have done this and why didn't I well actually no you couldn't have done it was your that's your body's protection response protecting you you don't get to argue with your nervous system responses and once you can let yourself off the hook for what you perceive you perceive that you should have done and you didn't it encourages healing because it's it's not your fault you know if, if people go tend to that freeze or that appease the fawn response then the, all of those questions can come into your mind why didn't i say something why didn't i why didn't i tell him to piss off you know why didn't i kick them because that would have put you in more harm yeah so with I've always said not always said since I've been on this journey mm. along the way I've picked up this quote and it's probably not mine who knows it could be um and that is you can't mindset your way through a trauma response mm -hmm. so I see this in my clients obviously in eating disorder recovery if they're paralyzed by making decision around what to eat mm. um, how can they then bring their their intellectual prefrontal cortex back online so they can then use the self-talk and use the mm. well, what choice do I have mm. am I right in sharing with them the first thing they need to do is as simple as take a breath try to ground try to feel safe and relax as much as possible physically and then they can use their mindset and their intellect because otherwise it also it goes offline in that fear response Absolutely. doesn't it yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and you know, you cannot access logical thinking if you are stuck in a fear state because the, the brain kind of works in the same way that it evolved. So first of all, the brain stem evolved. That's the bit that's the same as reptiles and that's responsible for our sense of, um, you know, for example, if we put our hands on a hot stove, we wouldn't be sitting there going, oh, that feels really hot. I think I'm going to take my finger off. Your finger comes off before you even think about it, right? And that's because your brainstem has kicked in to protect you. Yeah. And that's the bit that evolved first. On top of that evolved the limbic system, which is the emotional centers of the brain. And that's the bit that then goes, ow, that really hurt. Oh, no. And depending on what your inner voice is, either why on earth did I do that? What an idiot. Or... um oh no, I need to be kind to myself. That was really sad, you know? And then the, only then, once the emotional center is, is, is kicked in, does the prefront, does the, the cortex, the neocortex attach a story to that? Right, so yes. We need to use our brains in the same way that they evolved. So safety first, number one, safety first. Two, understand your fear response. And if you're in a fear response, understand that, your prefrontal cortex, it's not going to be working. The blood has been diverted to the other bits of your brain. Mm. And only then you can bring that logical thinking in because the your brain's going to come back online once you're not in that fear stress response. So yeah. everything comes down to danger and safety with your nervous system. Have you heard of neuroception? No, but I'm assuming it's a perception that you yes. choose to look at. Yeah, it is. so it's, it was, I think the term was, coined by Stephen Porges who's like a instrumental trauma scientist mm -hmm. and it's like our sort of spidey sense it's our sixth sense and it's our nervous system's perception of whether or not we're in danger yeah and once you understand that everything comes down to that and that you you're always scanning the horizon for danger right whether you notice it or not it's an unconscious response mm -hmm. then everything kind of makes sense because often we'll go through life and not notice the things that are making us feel unsafe and then wondering why we can't switch off in the evenings you know because you've just had a like you've got into an argument on Facebook and all of your stress responses caused all these adrenaline uh, like inflammatory and stress hormones to circulate around your body it was just a silly argument on Facebook, but your body takes that in the same way than if you've just been hunted down by a saber toothed tiger on the on the plains, you know, with your tribe, because danger is perceived the same way by your by your body. Yes. Regardless okay. of what the danger is. I've got two because I could talk to you forever, Ella. Honestly. <laughs> so knowledgeable. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. I'm learning so much. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
one kind of practical question that is an example of what my client would face and then sure. I want to just um you go into self-talk and how that helps or hinders our life and journey in general mm-hmm. so going back to um what I previously said about a client is in the supermarket the fear response hits them they yep. know before the fear response happened they know they want to and need to choose the fear food in order to recover from the eating disorder. Yet in that moment, it's almost paralyzing and they're unable to make a decision. So how would someone in that situation, eventually with the outcome of walking out of the shop with the fear food to eat to then progress on their journey to food freedom? Sorry, when you say fear food, can I just clarify what that means? Um, Say for example, something high calorie, chocolate bar. I see, okay. Yeah, so something that they've attached a sort of bad label to. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so how would they be able to make a decision in that moment? Yes, to choose that fear food because mm. part of eating disorder recovery is doing the opposite of what the eating disorder is telling mm. you to do. I think have for all behaviours that where thought is inhibited, having an action plan that you've established beforehand so have a list, have it on the list, you know, and you're just going around doing the list and then you don't need to think about the list because the list is already there. Yeah. So having the chocolate bar or the cake or the fruit or whatever it is on the list and then your brain can just autopilot down the list. And then you'll, when you get home at that point in the environment of your home, because you're safe and you're at home, you can, you hopefully your logical thinking brain will catch up with your decision making process but make it easy as possible in terms of for example people who i see who are in pain they need a self-soothing action plan they need something that they can turn to when they're feeling rubbish and they haven't got the cognitive skills to deal with it they can just take the list out of their handbag or look it up on their phone and say right this is what i need to do and just work your way through that list yeah great i'll get it delivered online so it's not even Mm. a choice it just arrives Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. And so lastly, then self-talk, how can that help and hinder um, our experience with pain? That's something that I did want to chat to you about. Mm, Yeah. So it's a really, really big one. And there's a huge correlation between persistent pain and negative self-talk. Because you've got three trillion cells in your body and they're all listening to you all the time. Yes. And you can't heal a body that you hate. And so if you're berating yourself because you haven't got better fast enough or if you have a thought process going along like something along the lines of, oh, my God, why is this happening to me? It's never going to get any better. I just need to toughen up. I can't believe it's not over already. What if I turn out like my mom? You know, all of this catastrophization. And especially if it's if you are being harsh on yourself, all of that is going to be the same as someone chasing you with a spear to your nervous system. Yes it brings an element of danger and the the bigger thing is the danger isn't something outside you can't just leave the environment where the dangerous thing is because the environment is in between your ears so being able to treat yourself kindly super important if you're suffering and a way that you can determine that is asking yourself one simple question would I speak to my best friend like that because Mm -hmm. if the answer is no because you're not going to say to your friend, oh, my God, just toughen up, <laughs> sort it out. I can't believe you're just being so lazy if they're suffering, right? You'd be a bit of a rubbish friend if you did. Yeah. If you're being too harsh on yourself, 100% that is going to be driving your suffering. Yes, and perpetuating it as mm-hmm. well. I um, Have you heard of Dr. Emoto? No, who's that? So he's... Um... <clears throat> excuse me I think he's from China and he is still alive and he's still doing all these experiments you you, do you have Gaia it's like a spiritual network oh is he the guy that does the sound experiments and talking to plants he's similar he's he does water stuff so yes he did the cymatics with the water yes yeah 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 so our bodies are what 90 percent water something like that 85 to 90 percent water and the rest of our body is about 70 percent so super high yeah Right. So then when we talk to water and this is everything, Mm. it's not just water, but they've done scientific studies on water Mm. and we we speak to a glass of water and we say, I hate you. You're not good enough. Mm. Mm. They put the cells um, of the frozen water under, under a, like a 
super, super magnifying glass, whatever they do yes. in the scientific labs. Yeah. And the cells have distorted and they've gone all like ugly looking and disformed. And then you take a different glass of water from the same original sort water source, yep. different glass and say, I love you, words of affirmation. Thank you. I'm grateful for you. Freeze the water, put it under this microscope. Beautiful, symmetrical, gorgeous symmetry mm. on, the, mm. on the cells. When we speak to our bodies like shit that same thing happens so 100%. bodies respond to our words so innately and actual matter of factly that we didn't even realize yeah uh, abs absolutely true and that is one of the ways one of the most powerful ways out of suffering especially physical pain mm. is to change the way you talk to yourself yes. you know cultivating that kind inner voice being a supportive ally to yourself um, catching yourself you know nipping it in the bud if you start to talk down to yourself how would I speak to my best friend and then talk to yourself like that it's huge yeah. I ask myself what would love say mm, that's lovely what a nice way of putting it or, or what would love do right now and then yeah. I just come back yeah. to who I naturally am and then I do or say or think or feel that way yeah that's beautiful because the thing is we forget that that's what we're made of we're all made of love we all come into the world just little amazing bundles of love and then life gets in the way and we can forget that but reconnecting to that is that's the basis I think of everything isn't it it is Ella and okay so I would love for you to share how can how are you working with people what have you got on the cards coming up how can people get in touch with you plug away as much as you like people <laughs> need to work with you thank you so I do offer a 30 minute free phone conversation and that's just really a chance to figure out if we would work well together at the moment I'm working one-to-one -one online and in person I'm actually going to be wrapping up my in-person work and moving my all of my work online within the next month or so so please if you you know that means that distance is absolutely no object and I can work with people and I am working with people all over the world I've got a client in New York at the moment you know some of the clients who, who's, who I've had the best results with I'll probably never even meet them in person mm. I'm also working on a group program which will be how to release chronic pain I've got four courses in the pipeline but I'm anticipating that they're going to take me between one and two years to write and release so in the interim I'm just trying to spread the word and get my message reached a little bit further out to attract people to me who would benefit to the way I work really. And, you know, that's people in chronic pain, that's people who have trauma, that's people who um, have very high levels of anxiety. I also work with people with phobias, the more sort of traditional hypnotherapy style stuff. Um, but chronic pain and trauma, it's a tough crowd, I'm not gonna lie, you know, <laughs> um, but that's my thing. That's what I get the most joy from working with. So yeah, feel free to reach out. My email is ella at breathbodymind.co.uk my website is breathbodymind.co.uk and I've made it very easy I've just with the help of lovely Julie helped to um, overhaul my website and the way people can contact me so it's made it super easy to get in contact for a for a free chat you know no obligation if you're feeling stressed in that particular moment I'll give you a couple of tools straight away to get the ball rolling because change can happen real quick right we just need to find the right inputs my job is to give people those inputs that's amazing Ella and I'll obviously I'll link everything below so people can just click so it's nice and easy thank for you. them please do um, thank you well, thank you for your time and for your wisdom and I've learned a lot I really appreciate the, the opportunity and it's been really super nice talking to you you too. And I absolutely, I already have a few people I'm going to connect you with for you to be guests on their podcast in different areas of the world, because this work is so needed. So thank you again. That was great. I really look forward to it. All right. I'll see you. Thanks, Victoria. Take care. Bye. Bye for now.